Let's say I was to seal the doors and windows to this room, suck out all the air. You'd last about 10 seconds, quite quickly turn blue, and I'm really sorry to report, but in about a minute and a half, you'd probably all be dead. Don't worry, I'm not allowed to do this experiment tonight. I tried my best, but something about research ethics, health and safety, basic common sense, I don't know. But if you are worried about your, supply to, your regular supply of air, you'd be right to. I spend my time researching what happens to people when they are deprived of oxygen, literally sucking the air out of rooms and seeing how they adapt to this. And to summarize all of my research in one simple sentence, oxygen, it's kind of a big deal. Now, everyone understands this, of course, oxygen's kind of a big deal. But believe it or not, this hasn't always been the case. In the 1600s, a scientist by the name of Robert Boyle was a rather controversial figure, and not just because he liked to go out wearing long, flowing wigs. Boyle was unusual for his time, as rather than just thinking about a problem and then trying to come up with the answer based on logic, he actually tested, a, tested his ideas, looking at whether or not his theories held up in the real world. Boyle was also fascinated as well by this concept of air, a kind of dark matter of the time, and trying to prove whether or not it even existed. And to this end, he bought this rather unfortunate looking torture chamber, which is essentially a small glass sphere with a bicycle pump underneath it. By means of his assistant's furious pumping, he was able to empty the sphere, and then when he put small birds inside of it, he noticed that they would rapidly pass out, and then, like I mentioned before, eventually die. On one particularly gruesome occasion, Boyle and his colleagues here at the Royal Society, not here at the Royal Society, down the road at the Royal Society, sat and watched as a small frog slowly swelled up and nearly exploded, all while they sat and enjoyed dinner in their show. About 100 years later, a Frenchman by the name of Jacques Charles was messing around filling brightly colored silk balloons up with hydrogen and seeing if he could make them fly. His first attempt was not so successful. The balloon got away from him and got blown away, crash landing in a local village where the villagers, convinced this magical flying beast must be a dragon, of course, proceeded to bravely defend their town and destroyed it with pitchforks and shovels. His next attempt was, to be fair, a smidgen more successful. In front of the King of France, Charles and a friend jumped in their balloon, gracefully ascended up to about 500 meters, hovered for a bit, and then came back down to Earth. Now, Charles, Charles could have stopped there. He had just flown a hydrogen balloon for the first time in history. He'd done so in front of the King of France, no less. And most importantly of all, he hadn't even been killed for being a dragon. But he wanted to push it just that little bit further. And so he convinced his colleague to jump out so he could save weight and try and go a little bit higher. Did that work? Yes. He immediately shot up to an altitude of what must have been three or four kilometers. The air at this altitude was so thin that his ears popped, and he started to feel faint and dizzy. Panicked by the experience, he made his more intelligent decision of the day and decided it was time to go back down and right now, becoming the first person in history to swear to never fly again. If we fast forward from there all the way to 1953, a countryman of mine by the name of Sir Edmund Hillary, accompanied by the Sherpa Tenzing Norgay, became the first two people to summit Mount Everest, almost nine kilometers above sea level. In 1960, Hillary returned to Everest to lead a scientific expedition, which amongst its many goals was to try and capture a Yeti. <laughs> Whilst they didn't find the abominable snowman bounding around the Himalayan countryside, a physiologist on the team by the name of John West noticed that every expedition member lost a significant amount of body weight. And when he looked closer, it was between five and 15 kilograms of muscle mass per person. And West hypothesized that maybe it was something about this thinner air that they weren't used to that was somehow dramatically affecting the individuals. It is this loss of muscle mass that I spend my time researching. Unfortunately, my research grants don't spring for flights to Nepal or even really cool co colored silk balloons. So in my own personal version of Boyle's frog exploding torture chamber, I filter the oxygen out of air and see what effect this has upon people. <laughs> it's just not very nice. The first thing that happens is you turn blue, yes, and you get a very wicked headache, of course. Trust me on that one. But there's other physiological measures that are quite important that we have a look at. You almost immediately begin to breathe deeper and more often, a phenomenon we call the hypoxic ventilatory response. And after a matter of hours, your blood begins to thicken as you produce more of a protein called hemoglobin, the thing that makes blood red and carries oxygen on it. And as we've, as we've recently shown, by taking muscle samples from people's legs while they're in this chamber, you, you seem to produce a different amount of a protein called myostatin, 
which is responsible for the growth of muscle mass, and we think might be involved in the loss of muscle when you climb high mountains. But Hillary and Tenzing, and every expedition that's ever followed them since, does not climb, do not climb Everest alone. They relied on teams of hundreds of Sherpa, a people who have evolved in relative isolation at four kilometers altitude or higher over tens of thousands of years, and perhaps even much longer than this. It is these people who have evolved in relative isolation in this extreme environment that every expedition relies on. And obviously, unlike you or I, they haven't wasted away. They don't show this muscle atrophy. So the key question, I guess, becomes, why? What's the missing link that we don't understand here? Is it the different environment that they live in? Or to put it more simply, has breathing different air led these people down a different evolutionary pathway? This graph has a look at differences in the Tibetan genome relative to Han Chinese lowlanders, with the horizontal axis representing the length of the human genome and the vertical representing differences from this reference gene. So each individual, each individual dot on this graph represents a difference, and the higher the dot, the bigger that difference is. When we have a look at this graph, one particular group of mutations stands out, all surrounding a single gene with the catchy and memorable title of EPAS1. EPAS1, which is sometimes known by its older name of hypoxia-inducible factor, is a gene that controls the response system in humans, governing how we respond to a lack of oxygen. What's really interesting about this mutation is it's only found in Tibetan individuals and not in any other group of people around the world, including other groups of people who have also evolved to live at high altitude. Also really interesting and worth noting about this mutation, it's the biggest single mutation seen in any group of people anywhere throughout humanity, as far as we know. Like I mentioned earlier, when people are exposed to high altitude, a characteristic set of responses begins to occur. First, we get a hypoxic ventilatory response. You breathe more often and deeper. And then you produce more of that protein, hemoglobin, to carry more oxygen in your blood. It would be reasonable to hypothesize, therefore, that people who have evolved to live at high altitude would show some sort of similarity to this result, increasing hemoglobin, breathing more often. And indeed, in Andean highlanders, a people who have evolved to live in the Peruvian mountains of South America, this is exactly the response we see. Increased hemoglobin, breathing more often than you or I in this room right now. However, when we look at Tibetan individuals, we do not see this response. Instead, they have a same level of hemoglobin that you or I would. And instead of breathing deeper and more often like we'd expect, they actually breathe less often than we do, putting them in a state which we would consider to be chronically hypoxic. This difference appears linked back to this EPAS1 gene mutation, as the greater the mutation in an individual, the greater this difference appears to be. And what's more, this EPAS1 gene mutation appears to be positively selected for, it has been evolutionarily conserved and appears to convey some advantage that we do not yet understand. The provision of oxygen has proven to be a powerful determinant in the evolution of humanity throughout history. Where the story becomes so very interesting is when you take two groups of people and challenge them with the same stimulus. One group has evolved in one way, like the Andean Highlanders, and another, facing the same challenge, has evolved in a completely different, indeed the exact opposite manner, Two groups of people, same challenge, different responses. So what, therefore, does all of this mean? When we take people and you breathe different air, we see responses beginning almost immediately. Your physiology changes, your blood begins to thicken, and indeed, eventually, your very body shape seems to change. Now, take the work that I do. We seal people in small rooms, we suck at all the air, and we see these changes begin to occur almost immediately. Then think about what would happen over the course of generations. This effect seems to be imprinted on people's very DNA and is passed down from one generation onto the next. And this, this goes on to create a different people. It is by studying people at the extremes of our planet that we learn about the adaptability of humanity and also the basic science of even how our bodies even work. There is so much we do not yet understand, so many missing links yet to uncover. It's by looking at these things that we take for granted, like the simple act of breathing, for example, that science still continues to surprise us, teach us about ourselves and our species. And maybe, maybe that's the point I want to leave you with tonight, when you leave this room afterwards. The very air you breathe, it doesn't just sustain you, it doesn't just make you who you are. 
but will continue to affect every generation of your offspring to come. Thank you.